Everything Falls Apart is uh, one of our most significant exhibitions for the year. And we designed it, um, or thought about it, and conceptualized it in a, in a number of ways. Um, firstly, I guess conceptually, we were really interested in looking at how artists are working to address and to document and to witness, to instigate and to participate in, in quite often localised dialogues about global issues and about what their ramifications might be. Um, we have purposefully, I guess, within that, it has eventuated that many of the works take the form of, of video works, which uh, seems to address both, both the kind of um, the way in which a narrative dialogue can be formed and documented, but also in its, its strong reference back to news production and media production and media circulation and distribution of images. So about how using the same, the artists are using the same device to, to further elaborate on issues that are, to a large degree, um, are learned and are witnessed through the medium of film and television. The exhibition has been um, developed as, as a two-part project. So the first component featuring artist uh, Jim Cohen, who's based in New York, um, Sarah Goffman, who's based in Sydney, Phil Collins, who is a uh, Scottish artist based in Berlin, and Sarah Morris, who is an American filmmaker and artist based in New York City. And of course, Alessandro Berte, Yazbek and Media Farzin, who have collaborated for the last couple of years and Media is based in New York and Alessandro is a Venezuelan artist based in, in once again in Berlin. So I guess the, the reason why this project is, is articulated, meaning that it sort of a, develops in, as a kind of a two-part model, is, is for a number of reasons. And, the first of which is, is conceptual, so we've used the part one of the project um, to foreground some of the broader issues of broader ramifications and of system dissolution, be that economic or cultural or governmental um, or political or indeed a combination of many of those things. So it's quite expansive in, in, in the first component where it's used as a, as a kind of, I guess, um, as a way to kind of introduce um, a breadth of, of systematic failure, but also in a, in a much more broader sense as well. Uh, part two of the project, and this is, this is, these are not steadfast rules, but this is simply the way that we've intended it to to kind of elaborate as, as, as part of a, um, a two-part narrative. The second component um, begins to home in and focus on specific situations or specific events that lead to these broader and wider and, 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 and more, more multifarious uh, dissolutions, processes of dissolution through focusing on quite specific events. Um, so in the example of, of Vernon Arke's tall man work, which focuses on or utilises surveillance footage and um, personal footage taken by inhabitants of uh, Palm Island in 2004 to really start to build a broader picture of, of what these racial relations within Australia are between the indigenous Aboriginal people and uh, European settlers. But yeah, that's a, I think that's a good example of how these particular events are used to kind of create an, an, an entrance into some of these broader issues that are elaborated upon. Um, that too is also discussed in, in the work, in the documentary work of, of uh, Zanny Begg and Oliver Ressler. Zanny Begg's a, a Sydney-based artist and Oliver Begg, uh, Oliver Ressler rather, is, is a Swiss artist based in, in, in Vienna. And their work, um, what would it mean to win, focuses upon the uh, G8 summit in, um, in Germany in, in 2007. And that begins to tease out some of the um, 
various positions and various solutions put forward. Solutions is probably too strong a word, but various propositions put forward by a number of um, activists towards the, the kind of exploration of what might be alternative models to our current systems of, of um, current system of, of global capitalism. In terms of the, the singularity of events as well, and, and, and done in kind of a, a quite an interesting way where it's acts as a historical document but also as a, a precursor to something that has come to be a, a very important idea of a historical marker in terms of global politics is the film Little Flags by Jim Cohen. Uh, so Jim Cohen in many ways has formed, a, has formed a kind of linkage between the articulation of part one and part two. And his beautiful and, and chilling film uh, Little Flags actually follows the, I guess, the, the aftermath and the residue of the 1991 ticker tape parade in Lower Manhattan following um, America's uh, victory, or then thought to be victory, in the Gulf War of 1991. And that was a work that he edited from 92 right through to 2000. And I guess post 2001, the work has taken on a, a much more chilling symbolism as it follows, you know, occasionally quite morose and forlorn and isolated figures as they walk through the uh, detritus laden streets of Lower Manhattan. Um, so, depending on when you begin to view this work, it can look, can read as nothing in terms of victory or a victorious celebration and read solely as the kind of um, bewildering walkthrough of, of a city under siege. This project we're also very honoured to present um, the work, uh, one of the most um, iconic works of a recently deceased prominent New Zealand filmmaker, a Māori filmmaker called um, Rata Mita, which is a film called Patu, which focuses on the uh, highly controversial tour of New Zealand by um, uh, the South African apartheid era football team, rugby union team in 1981 and it really looks at this event as a way to canvas and to discuss and elaborate on and bring to the fore New Zealand's own quite um, pro problematic relationships uh, between the Māori people and the Pākehā people. So this tour, this rugby tour, and you know given that rugby holds, holds such a special place within the the minds of, of, of New Zealanders. Um, this work really centres on something which, um, an event or a tour which in other circumstances would have been um, highly lauded, highly followed and highly anticipated. But it looks at this because of this apartheid era situation, really uses this tour as a way for New Zealand to begin to confront some of its own problematic uh, interracial relationships. Um, so we're doing this as, as a project that is, not, is uh, of course, integral within the wider exhibition framework, but given the um, significance that the film has within New Zealand culture, we're in the uh, New Zealand Film Archive who hold the exhibition rights for the film had suggested in their discussions, following their discussions with the, uh, the estate of, of, of Murata Mita, that there, it is their preference that the film is shown at scheduled times throughout the course of the exhibition so that it can be given um, a very focused atmosphere of attention. So the title of Everything Falls Apart is adopted from a single and uh, album from prominent US hardcore band from the early 80s, Huskadoo. Um, in our thinking about this exhibition um, as a framework of, of look, for looking at dissolutions of systems, it seems a very apt title to connote a kind of a, a, a certain fatalism, um, a predetermined 
sequential series of, of, of dissolutions and ruins. But within that, I think there is always um, a hope or an anticipation of what will emerge to fill the void of the breakdown of any particular system. So in many ways, I think of this title as, as um, alluding to the generative possibilities that might emerge out of any kind of failure of any kind of system. Um, for me, one of the particular projects that really reinforced this, this, this tension between um, optimism and, and fatalism are the works by Melbourne-based artist Tony Garfalakis, who are interspersed within the, the um, exhibition armature of part two of Everything Falls Apart. Um, for this particular project, umbrellaed under the title Affirmations, um, Tony purchased a number of um, gun targets that are freely available in the United States and generally used by military and policing forces to help them within their training institutions to, to make these very instant judgment calls between shoot or don't shoot. So Tony has opted towards many of the targets that are obviously rendered as targets. This, I mean, other targets that they produce are a pregnant woman or elderly people walking their dogs. But atop all of these, um, you know, quite in many ways, quite s these particular targets come probably produced in the 80s, and so they have a very sleazy kind of aesthetic to them, which really reinforces this, uh, this idea of, of um, character stereotyping in many ways. And atop the front of the, all of these targets, he has emblazoned a number of slogans which he has drawn from a number of sources, but predominantly self-help manuals or um, um, self-improvement guides. So within that, I guess, there is, the, there is this kind of visual cue of danger of, of um, an encroaching enemy, but there's also, it's kind of, um, it's rub lies in its, in its kind of positively affirming message which adorns each of those photographs. The context that everything falls apart emerges out of has, has a lot to do with the um, 18th Sydney Biennale. For the last 20, almost 20 years, Artspace has been a partnering venue with the Sydney Biennale. And uh, during some of our initial discussions with the artistic directors and the Biennale staff, as Cockatoo Island becomes more demanding of, of resources and with the MCA and the Art Gallery of New South Wales is now much bigger and more expensive venues, they, there was a desire on their part to try and consolidate the, the uh, number of venues that they would look at. So um, Blair French, uh, who was the executive director at Artspace and myself as curator had thought that this was a real opportunity for us to put Artspace's programming first and foremost. And then when we started discussing, you know, what the potentials were for this uh, three month period, we were very conscious of our local audiences and, and local artists and, and, and so far as um, the Biennale lasting for a three month period and we thought it would be more generous of us to do and more interesting for us to do a project that breaks down into a number of parts so we can kind of keep an ongoing momentum for our audiences in terms of how long and how that project would, would progress throughout that period. The, the, the kind of the framework for the exhibition itself I guess was developed as a, as a kind of a counterpoint to what we saw um, the direction of all our relationships forming. So we were not looking to do something that would, as a project that would be, that we needed to make read as something quite separate and outside of the Biennale. We were very interested in developing a project which would approach the current um, crises facing um, facing people around the world and how that's reinforced and reinterpreted um, and 
elaborated upon within artistic practice. And we would try and do this as a way of um, not looking at the connectiveness of individual artists, but looking at the interconnectivity of global crises and global issues and how uh, traumatic events in one part of the world have ramifications that reverberate throughout the world and manifest in different kinds of ways. So I guess that also started to lead how we would begin to break down these uh, articulated parts in, in which the first one more broadly, the first component more broadly foregrounds many of these larger issues and the second one focuses down into specific examples and instances of these um, points of collision and largely within the framework of this exhibition, the second part of the exhibition, how they manifest within a, 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 a local context, local Australasian context.